sure, we can have fire, and we can have the knowledge of fire, but with that comes the knowledge of everything. We become like a god, because to be all-powerful is to be all-suffering. Yes. All right, welcome back to Honored Madman, and today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite enemies, the Red Main Knights. So it's no secret that there's a lot of knight-themed enemies in the game, and that goes for both spellings of the word. But jokes aside, the vast number of knights in the game is something that has led to comparisons to Dark Souls 2. Definitely a lot of different kinds of knights in that game, and Elden Ring really is no different. In fact, it kind of takes that idea and dials it up a couple notches. There's so many knights in Elden Ring. There's four, well, technically five different kinds of regional palette swap knights that serve various lords. In this case, most of them are demigods with the exception of uh, Rhea Lucaria's knights. And on top of that, there are countless other knights who serve various demigods or various entities, both old and new. But yeah, I'm already getting a little off topic, but there are countless different kinds of knights in the lands between and even more types of soldiers, each one with its own unique eccentricities and lore and specifics. And most of this is quite rich, detailed, and unique, but I'm going to try and sum most of it up into just a couple sentences. The Cuckoo Knights are just up-jumped, magically enhanced cell sores. The Bloodhound Knights are dogs. Lindell's Golden Knights are Dragon Worshippers, the Banished Knights are Dragon Hunters, Clean Rots are Lepers who might be being sort of puppeted around by some type of Cordyceps, Crucible Knights are the leftover remnants of a forgotten age who have joined various different factions, Carrion's Enchanted Knights are nigh on extinct, the Halleck Tree Knights have too much health, the Mausoleum Knights are headless ghosts who are about as metal as it gets with those headless steeds they got. The Knights Cavalry have the coolest armor. Rykard's Gelmer Knights unsurprisingly became snake food. And the Godric Knights are just happy to be included. But the Red Mains, who served under the strongest demigod Radon. The specific group we're going to be talking about today are just badasses. Plain and simple. There's really no other way to describe them briefly. They've also got the most drip out of all the uh, palette swap knights, in my opinion. Because they're such prolific archers, they're known to wear one regular gauntlet and then one Lord Sworn Soldier gauntlet so that they can operate those great bows with ease. The armor itself consists of black and steel along with a red surcoat featuring the roaring lion of General Radon, along with a matching red cloak and red plumage that's said to symbolize the fiery red hair of their master, which itself was said to be a sign of being a great warrior. It's naturally heroic. Melenia and her clean rods may have known no defeat, but Radon's boys knew no weaknesses. These fellows are as cool as it gets, several of them, namely one named Aga, studied gravity magic at the Knox-built town of Celia alongside their Lord Radon, likely learning from the very same alabaster lord with skin made of stone that their master had. And the Red Mains, specifically the Archer ones, can be seen putting this knowledge to good use when they show off their abilities to perform the gravity shot or even the fabled arrow rain, straight out of Maple Story, both sort of like lesser versions of the massive ones that Radon is capable of performing, and it makes sense because he's a demigod and these are just men. It is worth mentioning, though, that Radon claims he only ever wanted to learn gravity magic so he could still ride his beloved horse, something his uh, ever-increasing size was making virtually impossible. So Radon and a handful of his knights studied gravity magic together at Celia, which to me sounds like a pretty solid manga or anime premise. Personally, I think the image of Radon and his buddies studying for a test is just too hilarious to pass up, but I think it could be really interesting, though, you know, exploring that time period. Especially because we know very little about his time at Celia or, you know, his motivations as a whole. Could make for a pretty decent story. Something like how they did that side story with Hanbei from Sekiro, a manga that is actually pretty damn good and I've been really meaning to do a video on. So the Red Maiden Knights are not only warriors, they're also scholars, just like the big man himself. And from all I can gather, it seems that their experience at Celia was a positive one because the town left a lasting impact on Radon himself who had to have held the city in high regard considering he went to war for them at one point. It was during something that would become known as the Star Scourge Conflict, Radon held Celia secure and stood tall ready to challenge the stars. Now this little tiny little piece of dialogue on a sword monument has led to several differing theories as to why Radon challenged the stars. And sure, it may not have even been exactly a war anyway, it is described as a conflict. 
Personally, I think that there was a, an Astel or a Falling Star Beast that was coming towards Celia and Radon shattered it, obliterated it into a million pieces, and then used his terrifying presence perk to sort of paralyze the rest of the stars into submission. And whatever spell he's using to hold the stars at bay seems to be passive. He doesn't seem to be actively maintaining it by the time we see him as he's completely insane. It's almost like his Riatsu is too strong, like from Bleach, his spiritual pressure. His sheer innate power could be what's just keeping the stars from falling. And as we know, there is a precedent for the uh, Nox built cities getting destroyed by falling stars. And Radon, being a graduate of Celia, would have a reason to defend it. Plus, there's other connections between the Nox in general and the Carrion royal family who Radon is descended from. It lines up nice enough. But that isn't to say that there aren't other theories. I mean, some people believe that he did it simply to uh, halt the fates of his rivals, specifically Mikula and probably indirectly Rani, which is why it led to Melenia coming down from the Hallow Tree to challenge Radon in the first place. I think another possibility could be that there was some sort of schism in the sorcerer schools of Celia. There's a suspicious amount of Lazuli school ones who believe that the moon and the stars are equal, but I don't think there's anything to suggest that they were initiating some type of hostile takeover to the point where Radon would have to intervene. But there are a lot of suspiciously locked away Nox sorceries and the uh, two Nox in Celia appear to be prisoners, although they could just be guarding Lusat's crown and Lusat himself appears to have been taken prisoner by a uh, twin sage or I can't remember if it's Carolos or twin sage. So yeah, Celia definitely has some stuff that needs to be further explored by me, but that's probably a topic that's better suited for another video. The biggest takeaway is that if the uh, Star Scourge conflict happened in Kaled and, you know, with Radon being present, his Red Main Knights probably also took part in it, as they too would have been graduates from Celia's gravity magic program. When the shattering broke out, Radon made the decision to attempt to take Landell, the royal capital, and these proud knights along with the Lord Sworn Soldiers and the Foot Soldiers attempted this siege with him. They were, however, beaten back by Margit the Fell Omen, which was essentially the alter ego of Morgoth, trueborn son of Godfrey and a royal omen who spent his life in the Shunning Grounds. After this failed siege, Radon and his men returned to Kaled, presumably to fortify the region against any impending attacks that were sure to follow after that attempted assault on the capital. But Kaled had a lot going for it. It had the Dragon Burrow, Grail, this massive dragon. It had Exikes before he got turned into a rot-infested shell of what he once was. Kaled had a lot of things going for it, not to mention some of the most skilled knights and soldiers that ever walked the lands between. But it wouldn't be long before Radon and his Red Mane's biggest threat would come marching down from the Hallow Tree. Allegedly on behalf of her twin brother Mikola, the demigod Melenia was cutting a bloody swath across the lands between. Also, she could challenge the supposed mightiest of the demigods, Radon. Her and her clean rot knights were just coming off of a very easy victory against Godric the Grafted, in which she actually spared him because she didn't want to stain her blade with his wretchedness. And we all know how that confrontation eventually played out. It wasn't based on the skill of their respective armies. I mean, the uh, Clean Rots and the Red Mains, they were probably quite evenly matched, not unlike the demigods they served. Melania and Radon essentially had what amounts to be an epic anime style fight, and towards the end of it, just as Radon was getting the upper hand, Melania bloomed. She caused a uh, Scarlet Rot nuclear style explosion, completely frying Radon's brain in the process and the entire land of Kaled. And this happened quite a while ago. You can actually see a uh, root like sort of spiral helix tree looking thing has grown from the exact spot where Melania bloomed. I think this uh, mass of roots is referred to as the Heart of Aeonia. But Caleb was changed overnight. It was now a red wasteland full of mutants. I mean, now there was giant mutant T-Rex dogs. It wasn't long before the uh, monstrous crows came down from the mountaintops to feed on the massive amounts of dead. It was truly a dire situation. And though Radon may have been gone, you know, his mind was completely obliterated and he was just wandering the wastes not really of any type of help at all. His knights proudly persisted, and they were blessed with none other than glorious purpose. The aftermath of his epic fight fell to his red mains to have to try to clean up, and presumably the first thing they did was bury their dead alongside the dead of the clean rot knights in the war dead catacombs. One of the deceased was unfortunately one of their proudest of members, red main knight Agha, who received an Erdtree burial. The War Dead Catacombs, in my opinion, say a lot about the Red Mains as a whole. 
They didn't have to bury their dead alongside the dead of their enemy, but they did. And hilariously enough, because of that, now there's ghosts of Red Maid Knights and soldiers fighting against ghosts of Clean Rot Knights for all eternity in those catacombs, but I guess that's a different story. That one seems more America's fault than anybody else. The Red Mains, though, remained as the de facto leaders of what was left of Radon's army, especially since their guest commander Jaren, when he showed back up, sort of dedicated himself to giving Radon a good death, something that the Red Maid Knights undoubtedly agreed with, but it also meant that they weren't going to receive much help from the uh, eccentric when it came to quarantining the lands of Caelid. That was something they were going to have to do all their own. These unfortunate knights knew they would never see their homes again, so they burnt the crest on their armor as a sign of their resolve and dedicated themselves to stopping the spread of this scarlet rot. This eldritch, infective, spreading evil that's sort of like the crimson from Terraria. And they would go about doing this in a number of ways, but most of them involved fire. They developed these new abilities through possibly their sheer resolve, Techniques like the Flame of the Red Mains that allowed one to spread an arc of flame or the Flaming Slash. I think the Flame of the Red Mains they were particularly proud of because it's sort of like uh, named after them. It's something they created. Some possessed the ability to keep their weapons permanently aflame, while other ones, namely uh, cavalrymen, somehow came up with the ability to shoot giant fireballs from their spear. While these abilities were restricted only to the Red Main Knight, the Lord Sworn Soldiers of Radon also had a few tricks up their sleeves, all fire-based, of course, to fit with the theme. Torch-equipped ones were capable of doing the Fire Breath attack even with normal torches, something that is reserved only for the Steel Wire Torch for us players, and they are, of course, more often than not armed with fire pots that they are more than happy to chuck at you. It's worth noting that the use of fire was strictly prohibited from the uh, protectors of the Erd Tree. Now, naturally, that probably didn't extend to the Red Mains, but its use was certainly frowned upon, and it's not like Radon and his boys gave much of a fuck about that, considering the state that their home was in. They truly had a burning resolve, which sort of sounds like the name of some sort of metal band or something like that. But the duties of the Red Mains weren't strictly to just wage an endless war against the Scarlet Rot. There's some evidence that suggests that they also organized some evacuations, particularly the nobles and the noble sorcerers who were often the relatives of some of the Red Main knights themselves. So I guess no surprise there. We can actually see an example of this in the game where it looks like they've hired a former gladiator of the Colosseums, a mad pumpkin head mercenary to be specific, to guide Caelid's surviving nobles to a semi-safe place, he even appears to have been assigned some Lord Sworn soldiers to assist him in this task. Finest soldiers in the land, according to their descriptions. And it makes sense too, I mean, it's said that the Red Mains only accepted the best, so it would stand to reason that their Lord Sworns are effectively the best and most effective Lord Sworn soldiers in the lands between. But yeah, this party appears to have led this rather large group of, uh, presumably Caelid nobles to safety or rather, relative safety. And the Red Mains themselves oversaw the construction of a smoldering wall that cut across the border of the two sub-regions that Caleb was comprised of. The border created by the smoldering wall stretched from Fort Gale all the way to Fort Faroth, and in the middle, there stood a small forward operating camp commanded by a Red Main Knight. And while some sections have crumbled, especially those near Grail, it still stands for the most part to this day. And obviously there's that considerable gap where that little canyon ravine thing is that leads to the Caelid Colosseum. Now this was the largest smoldering wall, but there are a number of smaller ones as well. One of which can be found on Caelid's border with Limgrave blocking the road, sort of standing as a warning on why you shouldn't proceed any further. It's like take a look at the sky and make your own choice. There's also a few smoldering walls at Fort Gale. But again, those were all relatively small compared to the great smoldering wall that stretched from one side of Caelid to the other. Now this was done presumably to stop the spread of the rot as the uh, explosion, the Scarlet Rot Aeonia, happened in the southern half of Caelid and the uh, Dragon Burrow and the Bestial Sanctum are located in the northern half. Both of those were considered rather sacred places to the people of Caelid and were uh, to be preserved at all cost. And sure, the wall couldn't stop what already happened, you know, the area was already affected by the Scarlet Rot, but it's notably less affected than the southern half, and uh, it still has trees, not those burnt out little black things that the southern half has. You can actually kind of see how this region was once referred to as wilds. Now, the smoldering wall itself, to me, looks like it's made out of regular stone mixed in with possible uncooling magma that may or may not be from Mount Gelmir, or it could just be whatever the uh, material was that was used to make the lava shield, as that is also referred to as uncooling magma, but I had just assumed it was made in Mount Gelmir. 
And if it is from Mal Gilmer, maybe Rykard sent it over. I mean, we already know he sent over a few abductor virgins. Plus, Old Richard still has that portrait of Radon hanging up in his drawing room, which leads me to believe that the two are on at least somewhat good terms, or that if nothing else, Richard still respects Radon. The Redmans also converted their flame-spewing siege weapons that were shaped in the visage of the fire giants into scarlet rot containment vehicles. And by converted, I mean they made absolutely zero modifications to them and just presumably started using them for containment purposes. Fort Gale in particular, where the wall began, was heavily fortified. It had four of these flamethrower siege machines, a horned chain lion from the crucible in the center, and it also has the only other Red Maid Knight besides Aga who's capable of the arrow rain. So that's another thing you'll have to look out for. And there is of course a full complement of Lord Sworn and foot soldiers commanded by these two knights, and this castle is sort of uncontested. Now the same can't be said about Redmain Castle, which sees a constant battle being fought out in front of it between a massive horde of giant dogs and the Redmain forces commanded by that horseback knight, where it appears that they periodically take out mass amounts of these giant dogs, then pile them up and burn them. This burning, of course, attracts more giant dogs, and the Red Man forces lie in wait for the opportune moment to begin their attack, and it happens over and over again. They don't, however, seem to quarrel much with the monstrous crows, and I don't really blame them for that. But it's not like the horde of dogs is actively trying to take Red Man Castle. I think they're just trying to set up shop in front of it, and the Red Man forces don't like that too much. Yep, gotta love yourself a fire. For some reason, the Red Mains probably didn't figure that the dogs would also be cannibals in addition to being violent scavengers. I think it's safe to say that they're regretting holding that open-air dog barbecue now that they see the results at least. I mean, they may as well have just set off a dinner bell if they wanted to attract more monstrosities. Although I do think the dogs are probably what are keeping the crows at bay. Although there is that one crow that's eating the dead Red Mains at that camp right near Kalem Ruins. Which reminds me. The Red Mains would have to be pragmatic in their containment, and sometimes that meant whole villages had to burn if they were too far gone. This scorched earth policy of theirs wasn't without its downsides, as can be witnessed at the Kalem ruins near the smoldering border. The surrounding area is crawling with our T-Rex armed canine friends, and the road is blocked by an inert hearse caravan cart thing. The nearby Red Main camp is in ruins and its occupants routed. The ruins themselves are held by two pumpkin heads, loyal to the Red Main cause, and they're presumably in charge of the three fire giant mobile flamethrower units that occupy the ruins. But the Red Main's severe burning of this region and its dead, coupled with Merica moving the Rune of Death to the recycling bin, have caused the buried and burned dead of Kalid to rise as burning, exploding zombies, as seen with the residents of the Kalim ruins. Radon's boys truly couldn't catch a break, as even their only solution had unforeseen consequences. Not only were there spontaneously combusting zombies, there were also hordes of reanimated scarlet rot corpses that can frequently be seen roaming the various roads of Kalid. The place truly is an apocalyptic wasteland. Personally, I think they should consider themselves lucky that the monstrous crows haven't started grazing closer and closer to their castle. Because at the end of the day, they are pretty fortunate that it's just the dogs. And what's interesting is the dogs aren't even really feral. I mean, we know Gowrie was able to tame one of them. It's even got a sick collar. You'd think by this point the Red Mains themselves would be trying to tame the dogs, maybe even riding them into battle. But alas, that's probably a uh, rant video topic for another day. And you know, maybe if they didn't burn all the uh, carcasses of the dogs right in front of the castle, it wouldn't attract so many more. Because it does sort of seem like the dogs are actively seeking out Red Main Castle in some way. Although this could just be me once again giving dog intelligence way more credit than it deserves. The castle itself is ridiculously secure and defended. It's got just about everything. Trebuchets, multi-shot explosive ballista arrows, a fucking giant with a flaming sword sitting on top of the watchtower. And let me just say, he sure knows how to make an entrance, that's for sure. And on top of that, there's at least one pumpkin-headed merc, one particularly deadly red main page, Rykard's gift of an uh, upgraded abductor virgin with both a wheel and a blade attachment, and of course not one, but two chain lions. A similar situation to that can be found at the entrance of Castle Soul. 
Which reminds me, there's also a colossal amount of Banished Knight and Exile Soldier weaponry just lying around, hanging up in the rafters, leaning against tables. There's even several of those fully functional dragon-themed flamethrower devices, and those are mounted all over the castle, specifically protecting the festival area. Now, all this uh, Banished Knight paraphernalia seems to indicate that at some point they might have uh, resided at Redmain Castle, or they just happen to be frequent festival goers. But as it stands, it's currently tough to say whether or not this equipment was seized from the Banished Knights, or if they just left it here after dying while participating in the festival. The castle itself is presumably managed by the three Red Maid Knights and the guest commander, Witch Hunter Jaren, famous for hunting a witch. But yeah, as I previously stated, this place is heavily defended. But the three Red Maid Knights do have the good graces to clear out the castle when Jaren wants to hold his festivals. Shit, they probably want Radon to get a good and worthy death too, and if all they have to do is clear out of the castle for a few hours every year, then of course they're gonna oblige. Plus, there's no shortage of work to be done in the uh, rest of Kaled with the whole burning out the spread of the rot. And these Red Maiden Knights, along with their soldiers, were nothing if not tireless in their efforts to stop the spread. And so far, for the most part, it's confined entirely to Kaled, so they are successful in keeping it from spreading beyond Kaled's borders. But that smoldering wall was only moderately efficient in terms of stopping the spread to the Dragon Burrow and the infecting of all the dragons. Some were just outright killed by the Scarlet Rot. But that's hardly the Red Main's fault. The damage was already done by Melania, they're just doing what they can to lessen it as best they could. But I think the Red Mains are doing pretty good, all things considered. I mean, they seem to be holding on to their senses a lot better than some of the other knights that are out there in the lands between. They've got forts, camps, patrols, combat tactics, ambushes military containment operations that are happening in the uh well for lack of a better word battlefield in front of red main castle's impassable great bridge i mean their actions and their skill in combat speak for itself the red main knights and soldiers are ridiculously competent at just about everything they've dedicated themselves to doing and even though they are in fact fighting a losing battle i think that that small fact uh is made abundantly clear if you just take a look at what they're doing in game but obviously Redmain Castle was probably their most significant fortress. I would say Fort Gale is probably their second most secure position aside from the Redmain Castle itself. But on the other end of the smoldering wall lay Fort Faroth and there was something entirely different going on there. Now this place was presumably just as secure as Fort Gale. However, that is not the case when we show up there. Some sort of anomaly must have happened here because the entire lower section is not filled with red mains. Instead, it's overrun with winged dams and giant bats. And the second layer just under the roof is crawling with rats. So presumably it's been functionally abandoned for quite some time. The situation on the roof is even more curious. It appears a great number of Godric foot soldiers were hung here, which is interesting because you can also find some of these strung up Godric soldiers in the Red Main Castle. So perhaps at one point this fortress was manned by Godric soldiers only for it to be taken by the Red Mains. For example, maybe Godric's boys came down here after they fled the capital trying to take refuge in this fort. But that's all speculation as these are only the remains of some foot soldiers who might not even be related to Godric at all. But that's hardly the most interesting thing about this rooftop. Walk around up here for a little bit and you'll soon be ambushed by Red Main Lord Sworn soldiers, but not quite the normal ones. These appear to be spectral puppet-like versions who possess all the same abilities as the normal Red Main soldiers, but they sort of just uh, respawn indefinitely. Now, I suppose the big question is, were these Red Main soldiers turned into puppets willingly? And it's definitely possible. I mean, we see a whole group of uh, Carrion Noble puppets led by a puppet version of a giant troll Carrion Knight waging war on some cuckoo soldiers in Lyernia, and another large group of noble puppets can be found under the command of a preceptor in the Carrion study by the name of Miriam. And the art of puppetry, or turning living things into puppets, was an art that was rediscovered by the Carrions during their research into Nox culture, something that a certain preceptor named Celibus took quite the liking to. But I'm getting kind of off topic. There was no Red Main Knights here at this uh, Fort Faroth, only these puppet Red Main soldiers. And these guys appear to be bound to Fort Faroth to serve as its eternal guardians. Although I guess that only applies to the rooftop, seeing as how they've done nothing about the horde of pests that have taken up residence down below. 
But I can only assume that they are still serving out their duties even in this puppet-like form. And Fort Gale is seemingly an important strategic point for the Red Mains given that it uh, sort of sits at the far end of their reach of influence, much closer to the Dragon Burrow than any of their other encampments. The Red Mains are likely spread too thin to do anything about the situation at Fort Faroth and probably figure the pests taking up residence down there give it an added layer of defense given that the garrison stationed at Fort Faroth is comprised entirely of puppets now. I still think it's a really mysterious situation, but there's really not much else for me to speculate on. But the Red Main Knights and the Lord Sworn and Foot Soldiers they commanded truly drew the short straw and still rose up to the occasion. They fully embodied the image that was their banners, and I think even Godfrey himself would be proud of the Red Main Knights. And so would Radon, you know, if he was still capable of forming coherent thoughts. But I believe that's all I wanted to say about the Red Main Knights. I still have a video about the destruction of Kaled coming up at some point. So I didn't want to get off topic too much because I'll be covering a lot of that stuff soon anyway. But uh, I probably still did. But who cares, it's always a fun time. Anyway though, I hope you guys found the video to be at least somewhat amusing and informative or entertaining. Uh, if you liked it, please like it. If you dislike it, please dislike it. And if you like these uh, fun little video game lore rants, plus the occasional rant about a TV show or a movie that I find interesting, please consider subscribing. We're about to crack 25k, which is, again, a pretty big deal. Maybe we'll do a special video when we hit it or something like that. But anyway, let's have our outro and then the final thoughts, shall we? So I was rewatching Game of Thrones, and I know I haven't rewatched any of Game of Thrones since before the eighth season came out. It kind of soured me on the whole thing. But with the whole House of the Dragon stuff coming out soon, I figured I would rewatch. And I forgot how good the earlier seasons is. It's not until like about some of the stuff in season four where it starts dropping off. And even then, there's still good scenes and good episodes. But yeah, I think I'm going to actively try to cover House of the Dragon as it comes out. I probably will do a little video on those two trailers. I'll probably wait a couple weeks. I got too much other shit to focus on. Plus, there's this other trailer video for Fallout that I'm already got done. I just got to edit the video part together. It's a whole thing. But the audio video, I have some uh, an update on that. It has uh, begun the recording process. So that should be done pretty soon as well. I do have a couple of Elden Ring War videos that will come out in the meantime. And a couple of uh, non uh, Elden Ring videos also planned. But again, a lot of great stuff. I know I always say that, but uh, it's uh, it's true. It's never not true. But anyway, though, guys, I'll be seeing you real soon with uh, probably the Albinoric video next. I have this other thing about Mog and Morgoth I wanted to do as well, plus the uh, first weekly conspiracy rant video thing I'm planning on doing is going to come up soon. I just don't want to start it until I'm confident that I can keep up with doing it once a week. My good buddy Mindspatch made this really awesome art for it, though, so I'm definitely going to be making use of that very soon. But anyway, I've uh, rambled on enough. I will see you guys real soon. Uh, be safe, and until then, see ya.